So I will press share screen as soon as you give me the word. Right. Hi, Chris. Hi, Lan. It's good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. That's an ocean in your background. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a virtual background. I'm not actually in the Dublin Hills at the moment. Uh Hi, Brian. Hello, Len. Sorry, my audio was off. Yeah, hi. So, okay, I think it's good to start. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the third time we've tried an online seminar. The last two times were actually quite successful, and we're very happy today to have the speaker, Leonard Gross. Leonard is well known in various fields of mathematics, also in quantum field theory. His uh, early achievements include understanding hypercontractivity in the case of the fermion system and also in establishing and developing hypercontractive inequalities and the logarithmic soberleft inequality. And Lenny has also for years been interested in gauge theories. He's going to tell us today about equivalence of felicity and Euclidean self-duality for gauge theories. So Lenny. Uh, there we are. Uh, I want to show you uh, an experiment that I think that uh, many of us have already done many times. But for a reminder, here are two sunglasses. This is the left lens of the right lens, and here's the left lens and the right lens of the other one. And they are overlapping with, as you can see, a, a source of uh, electromagnetic radiation in the background, uh, sometimes known as a lamp. And the uh, lamp at the top is too bright. So if you will uh, focus just in this region over here, you can see that the 
this region is darker than this region because the two um, sunglasses are overlapping here and, and not over here. Both sunglasses are between the lamp and the camera. Now here I've rotated one of them 45 degrees, and this is now darker, this region right here is darker than this one was over here. And now I'm going to rotate this further, if I can get this to move. This, the behavior has changed. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, now here it's rotated 60 degrees. And you see this region of double overlap is much darker than the corresponding region over here. And here is 90 degrees, and it's essentially completely obscured. So I want to explain to you how polarized sunglasses work because I want to make a draw a line between the um, these polarized sunglasses and uh, self-duality. Can I make a comment? Pardon? I'd just like to comment that the um, material Polaroid was invented by Edwin Land in 1930 when mm -hmm. he was a Harvard undergraduate senior. Uh huh. And uh, this is uh, maybe also doubly appropriate because we are doing this in the physics department. And so I felt I should start with an experiment. Now I am not looking up at you, I'm looking at, at Arthur. So here's how polarized sunglasses work. Maxwell's equation is an empty space, let me remind you. And I'm going to use curl to be noble cross. And eventually I'll have to use curl on one forms and that is star D. Plane wave solutions to Maxwell's equations. Here are a couple of plane wave solutions. Psi is a positive constant omega times T minus Z. And uh, this function of uh, these functions E and B of X, Y, and Z, T are solutions to Maxwell's equations. You can uh, check that at your leisure. A and B are arbitrary real numbers. Power propagates in the direction of the pointing vector, which means uh, upwards along the positive Z axis. Uh, well, one should think of the solution as a very rough approximation to a flashlight beam. The beam is pointing upward along the Z axis. And uh, I, I want to look at two special cases uh, for fixed X, Y, and Z, the end point of the vector E moves around the ellipse. You can see that from um, this expression. We're keeping X, Y, and Z fixed since the solution doesn't depend on X and Y, we're only keeping Z fixed. So as T moves forward, Psi increases. This is really an ellipse if A and B are not both equal to zero, but if B is equal to zero, then we can see that uh, the, from the solution, from the solution of B is equal to zero, then A just moves back and forth along the x-axis, which you should think of being as horizontal, and the y-axis as being vertical for the purpose of our application to reflection from cars in front of us. So if B is equal to zero, the electric vector moves back and forth along the x-axis, while the B moves back and forth along the y-axis. And this is a prototype of horizontally polarized light. E is the vector that one uses to decide whether this is vertical or horizontal. Now, typically what happens when, is that when light 
from the sun bounces off the curved roof of the car in front of you. The light becomes horizontally polarized in this reflection. Uh, if you have polarized sunglasses as um, invented by Mr. Land back in the 1930s, uh, then the sunglasses will only allow vertically polarized light through, thereby uh, cutting out that source of glare. So it will not only reduce the total amount of uh, light coming through, but will also cut out the part that's the most annoying. On the other hand, if, if A is equal to plus or minus B, then the tip of the electric vector moves around in a circle as time increase, increases. Uh, so does the tip of the magnetic field. Uh, this is the case at any fixed point X, Y, and Z anywhere in space. Uh, now, I, I want to describe to you some left, right, and up, down stuff, which I presume you're not going to be able to memorize. Uh, that circle, the direction of rotation depends on whether A is equal to B or A is equal to minus B. Looking down on one of these circles from above, the light beam is called left circularly polarized if the electric vector is moving counterclockwise, and right circularly polarized if the electric vector is rotating clockwise. Looking down from above, by the way, is the same as, as looking uh, up the beam of the flashlight. Uh, physicists usually refer to left circularly polarized light as having positive velocity, and right circularly circularly polarized light as having negative velocity. Uh, now, I, I presume that you have uh, uh, are not ready to uh, memorize the relation between left, right, and uh, down the beam and up the beam, and uh, uh, clockwise or counterclockwise. So here's some good news. Uh, it happens that in the case of positive velocity, which means left circularly polarized light, well, the curl of E is a positive multiple of E and the curl of B is a positive multiple of E. And that's for positive multiplicity. And for negative multiplicity, we have the opposite signs. So this is the only thing that you have to remember. This positive and negative of these two uh, eigenfunctions, EB, is uh, really going to be the central point of this whole talk. So uh, the definition of helicity that I just gave you is defined in terms of plane wave expansions. I gave you one example of a plane wave. Uh, the goal is to try to understand whether or not there is a notion of uh, helicity for yang mills theories. And yang mills the yang mills hyperbolic equations are highly nonlinear. Plane wave expansions are out of the question. And uh, so therefore, we may ask whether or not helicity has any gauge invariant meaning in non abelian gauge theories. What, what I'm going to do is to show you that in the electromagnetic theory, the plane wave definition of helicity that I just sketched is equivalent to anti-duality, anti-self-duality of uh, gauge fields. In Yang-Mills theory, we, we have already a ready notion of uh, dual self-duality and anti-self-duality. And I'm going to use that then to make a definition. But definitions are cheap. And in order to justify that definition, uh, I'm going to prove a couple of theorems. So coming back to the electromagnetic case. Uh, recall that uh, given the electric and magnetic fields A and B, the, there is a, a gauge potential, which I'm going to choose in temporal gauge. You see that uh, I just goes from one to three. And the gauge potential 
is related to E and B in, the, in this way. B is curl A, E is minus A dot. I, I think and hope that I am reviewing well-known stuff about uh, Maxwell's equations. In terms of um, A, Maxwell's equations are simply have this form. Del inversion A equals zero and the side condition divergence A equals zero. Now I, I mentioned I mentioned uh, plane wave expansions. And here's a typical one. This generalizes the expansion that I showed you a moment ago, not the expansion, but the particular solution that I showed you a little while ago. And uh, if for the canonical formalism for electromagnetic theory, the Qs and Ps are given in terms of A by uh, the initial value of A, uh, that's going to be a Q, and the uh, time derivative of A at time zero, which is the electric field, is typically the P in the canonical formalism. So uh, I want to use this now to describe the electromagnetic phase space. Uh, all of this, by the way, is, is really standard stuff uh, different authors have different opinions about what the phase space in electromagnetic theory should be. Some uh, prefer a more relativistic format, uh, but I'm going to stick with the one in Bjorken and Drell, which takes the, which, which uses the uh, temporal gauge. And in fact, here I'm going to combine the temporal gauge with the Coulomb gauge. And uh, I, I just I want to reassure those of you who are horrified that I'm combining the Coulomb gauge with the temporal gauge, that when we get to yang mills theory, I will drop the Coulomb gauge and just use the temporal gauge. So the electromagnetic phase space. We can start from scratch now. Um, forget about the time dependent A that we had before. The A from now on will be just a function on uh, space. And uh, I, I want to describe the configuration space and phase space uh, in, in quantitative terms. So, the Sobolev space, H sub A, is, the, is going to be a space of such uh, potentials A, these are real valued at the moment, uh, which have uh, A derivatives, little a derivatives in L2. So little a derivatives means that you take the square root of minus Laplace, and that's the one half. That gives you one derivative, you raise that to the power A, and that gives you A derivatives. And A equal to one half is going to be the case of, of interest to us. So the configuration space I'm going to take to be the space of gauge potentials on R3, which are in Coulomb gauge and which have the size uh, H one half. I want to assure you right now that a choice of one half is, is not me. I'm not doing that. I'm just following what um, has been chosen primarily by Bardman and Wigner, but actually that H one half really goes back to uh, Lando and Pyros in, in 1932. Can I so ask a question? Yeah. Lenny? Sometimes one adds an L2 norm. Uh, is that, does that make any difference? Yes. Yes, we definitely don't want to uh, add an L2 norm. Now, that's a very good question. Uh, the adding the L2 norm really does spoil 
a, a lot of uh, basic theory. And not adding it uh, adds trouble, real trouble, uh, especially when the sublet inequalities are borderline and you are getting an L infinity estimate when you do have the added on L2 norm and you don't get it when you don't add it on. And we cannot add it on. I'll uh, show you in a moment the theorem of Bartman and Wigner that says there is no choice for this norm except the one that I am using here. Okay, the, the dual space, C is a Hilbert space, and it's dual space in the pairing, in this pairing, the dual space is H minus one half. So C star will also consist of divergence-free fields, which will be interpreted as electric fields, uh, with a Sobolev norm H minus one half. Now the phase space, as usual, the cotangent bundle of configuration space consists then of pairs, an A and an E, and with both of them having divergence zero, uh, the divergence E equals zero, of course, is, uh, means where there's no charge, and we are only concerned with the theory in which there is no charge, because um, helicity, plane waves, is, is about a theory with no charges in it. And uh, the, the norm on phase space will require both the norm and configuration space to be finite, that's this term, and the norm on the dual space to be finite. Uh, by the way, in terms of uh, B, instead of A, the, uh, the H one half norm of A is the same as the H minus one half norm of B, uh, because B is curl A. Borgman and Wigner, 1948. showed that this norm that I've just described, which I'll put back here, uh, this norm is Lorentz invariant in the following sense. We have functions A and E, which are defined only on uh, space right now, or a three. Uh, but if you solve Maxwell's equations, with the initial conditions, a of zero equals a and a dot of zero equals minus e, uh, then you will get a solution to Maxwell's equations defined on all of R4. And now a Lorentz transformation acts on such a function, on such a solution on R4. So if you Lorentz transform by any Lorentz transformation, uh, that solution, and then restrict that solution back to the t equals zero hyperplane, you'll get another pair A and E, and they will be back in our phase space. They will have exactly the same norm. In that sense, this norm is invariant. The space the way I've described it, A and E, terms of A and E, it looks real, but actually it has a complex structure on it, a unique complex structure that commutes with Lorentz transformations. And with respect to that structure, the, the Lorentz group acts unitarily. I, I want to go back to the curl. You know, the operator curl acts in the Hilbert space as a self adjoint operator. All you have to do is an integration by parts to see that. And it has a, a zero null space in configuration space uh, because the divergence of A is equal to zero in the configuration space. 
So the curl has a. Uh, I have a question. Normally, yeah. a derivative is a, a skew adjoint operator. Uh, that's right. But because of the taking the cross product, the curl, nobla, nobla is skew adjoint, but nobla cross is self adjoint. Uh, that, that's a, 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 a cute subtlety, which has to do actually with uh, the fact that the usual, the adjoint representation of a, a compact Lie group with respect to uh, the, the standard kind of inner products on the Lie algebra are themselves skew adjoint. So if you take, think of uh, Del cross, Del is skew adjoint and cross is skew adjoint and the product of the two of them is self adjoint. So let's uh, let, C plus denote the positive spectral subspace of curl and C minus the negative spectral subspace. Uh, these these are, are mutually orthogonal uh, because the, there is no um, eigenvalue zero. Zero is not an eigenvalue. The null space of curl is, consists only of zero. So the configuration space decomposes under curl uh, in this way, and, and that automatically induces a decomposition of um, phase space. A, a way to say it that some of you might feel more comfortable with is that uh, T star of C plus uh, consists of those electric fields which are, are conjugate to some element of C plus. Uh, on the other hand, most of you might feel more comfortable with just reading this as it is. So uh, that equation 14 says that uh, any pair in the phase space is uniquely a sum. The uh, potential can be broken up into two pieces and the electric field can be broken up into pieces, two pieces uniquely. And with uh, A plus and C plus, and uh, as I said, E plus a conjugate momentum to some element of C plus. So where do we stand? I, I've introduced so far configuration space and phase space in, in a quantitative way and the, those choices are, are not up to me. They are up to Mr. Lorenz with the help of Bartman and Victor. These choices of configuration space together with their norms are, are really uniquely determined by Lorenz invariant, by Lorenz invariance. And the, the operator curl decomposes configuration space into two subspaces, which automatically decompose phase space into two subspaces. Okay, you got that? Before we get to the first theorem. Uh, before we, we do that, I want to emphasize that the decomposition of phase space was a consequence of the definition of configuration space. So the definite, the, the decomposition of configuration space is really the primary input to everything that I've said so far. Now, what has this got to do with helicity? Suppose that we extend an initial condition A, E to a solution to Maxwell's equations, uh, then its plane wave expansion is composed entirely of plane waves of positive helicity, uh, if and only if, the pair AE is a point of T star of C plus. On the other hand, as plane wave expansion is composed entirely of plane waves of negative helicity, if and only if the pair, the point, that's the point of phase space, is lies in the space T star of C minus. So, Glenn, we, yeah. Glenn, can I ask a question? Are yeah, these, sure. Uh, Positive helicity and negative helicity subspaces, they're Lorentz invariant? 
Yes. Yes, that's right. Uh, Andre, that's is the identity component of the Lorentz group? They, they are uh, invariant uh, under the identity component of the Lorentz group, yes. Uh, and uh, oh, that's a good point. Um, if under time reversal, they, they interchange. And under space reversal, I think they also interchange. I'm not sure about that at the moment. So okay. the invariance under the connected components of the identity um, is correct and not for the full Lorentz group. So we now have a characterization, a characterization of helicity for normalizable solutions to Maxwell's equations, uh, which depends on the canonical formalism and on the um, spectral subspaces of curl. What I want to do now is to get rid of the curl because the a curl is itself not a good thing to be using for non-abelian gauge theories. There is a covariant version, and I'll show you later where it fits in, but it does not fit in the same way that we are using it right now. So I'm now going to, then the second step, I've gone from plane waves expansion to the um, spectral subspaces of curl, and now I want to get rid of the curl. the Maxwell-Poisson equation. Uh, I'm going to let little a of x. Now, s is running over greater or equal to zero, and this should be interpreted, the pair point xs should be interpreted as a point in Euclidean half space. The ajs are real, and never mind this technicality, the, the curvature, the four-dimensional curvature of this one form on R4, plus on the positive half space. The four dimensional curvature of that is uh, given thus. D is still the three dimensional exterior derivative operator. The Maxwell Poisson equation with initial value A uh, is defined in this way. Uh, this is a not simply the Poisson equation for a three component vector because d star d is only a portion of the Laplacian. You know, minus the Laplacian on one forms is d star d plus d d star. This is missing the d d star. With the result is the result that, that this is not an elliptic equation on the half space. It's a degenerate elliptic equation. But this equation with the uh, initial value A has lots of solutions. The solutions that we're interested in are those for which the L2 norm of the curvature is finite. So let me state that as a theorem. Uh, if A is in configuration space, and now we're not looking at the phase space anymore, just the configuration space. If A is in the configuration space, then the Maxwell Poisson equation has a unique solution with finite Poisson action. Uh, moreover, that H1 half norm that I'm sure many of you uh, frowned upon happens to be exactly the L2 norm of the curvature. Len, can I ask a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's possibly stupid, but plane waves are not, uh, don't have this finite Poisson action. Do they? they do not have po finite Poisson action, that's okay. right. So they're not an example of this. They are not an example, right. So when I said plane wave expansion, uh, I did not mean to include the, the elements uh, of the expansion, nor the example that I gave you at the beginning. Okay, thank you.
So the usual notions of self-dual and anti-self-dual, I'm repeating here. Uh, A is self-dual. Uh, if the four-dimensional Euclidean star operation applied to F gives back the two-form F, and anti-self-dual if it uh, gives back minus F. Here's the, the second equivalence. If A is a point in configuration space and A is its Poisson extension, then A is in the, remember, the negative spectral subspace of curl, if and only if its Poisson extension is self dual. It's in the positive spectral subspace, if and only if its Poisson ex extension is um, anti-self-dual. So we, we now have a, uh, we have now replaced the spectral subspaces of curl by self-duality and anti-self-duality. So we, we are getting close to something that you see is going to make sense for non-abelian gauge fields as far as the proof of this goes, this is computational. The solution to the Maxwell Poisson equation is simply given uh, in this form. C, you remember, is a, a self adjoint operator. Its absolute value, that's the square root of C star C, is a positive operator. And so this is a very nice uh, semi group bounded semi-loop in L2, if you apply it to the initial condition A, you get the solution to the Maxwell Poisson semi-group. And using that representation, uh, this whole theorem can be proved very easily. So, so here's where we stand. We now have three notions, three ways to define helicity for a normalizable solution in electromagnetism. We have the definition by its plane wave expansion. That's the original one. That's how helicity has been defined up until now. And it can be constructed in terms of a spectral decomposition of the configuration space by curl, uh, or it can be defined by self or anti-self duality of the Maxwell Poisson extension to a Euclidean half space. So we, we have three ways of, three equivalent ways of defining uh, helicity. So before we go to the Yang Mills uh, theory, um, I want to point out that we have to give up on plane wave expansion for uh, Yang Mills theory. No one has anything that could be called a plane wave expansion for a nonlinear wave equation like a, a hyperbolic Yang Mills equation. We do have a standard notion of self duality and anti self duality for uh, connection forms on the half space of R4. And the, I'm going to use that to make a definition of what helicity should be about for Yang Mills, uh, but I'm going to want to go back to get the nonlinear analog of this. And I have to do that. I'll have to do that to, so that it's more than just a definition. Uh, I intend to show you that there is a nice analog of this for Yang Mills theory. Okay, uh, we're switching gears now. So K will be a compact connected Lie group of Lie algebra K. A, a k-valued connection form, um, again in temporal gauge on R3. And uh, script A is going to be some space of such connection forms. <clears throat> you should think of them uh, like uh, H1 half forms as far as their size goes, similar to what I was uh, describing before. Uh, there are some complications, and that's why I put in sort of the gauge group now playing a more central role. These are functions from R3 to K. 
which are which have to be correspondingly of a Sobolev size uh, H3 halves of R3K. And uh, a gauge function acts on uh, connection form A uh, in this standard way. And the conventional choice of configuration space is um, A mod G. In the electromagnetic case, I chose a section of this that was the Coulomb, given by the Coulomb gauge. And uh, such a section is not a healthy thing when dealing with the non-abelian gauge theory. So I'm not going to choose uh, any such section. Let's go immediately to the Yang-Mills Poisson equation, which is the analog of the Maxwell Poisson equation. Uh, again, we're going to extend capital A by a little a of xt, which is, uh, uh, again, a k-valued function. And it is defined on the positive half space. Uh, its curvature has usual. Now, this is the three-dimensional curvature. F, I'm going to use to be the four-dimensional curvature. And they are given by these formulas. The, the three-dimensional curvature, B, uh, involves the three-dimensional exterior derivative. So three-dimensional curvature, four-dimensional curvature. And there are two ways to look at this uh, function A. It's either a one form on R3, you see here, for each S, uh, or it's a, a one form on R4 plus positive half space with no fourth component. So it's an Euclidean temporal gauge. The Engels Poisson equation uh, is uh, the generalization of the Maxwell Poisson equation. Remember, here I had dA, now we have B, the, the curvature instead of instead of simply dA, and with the initial condition A of zero. The Poisson action of A is again, I'm going to define it the same way, the L2 norm of the curvature. Now, it's important that the Poisson action be gauge invariant, and it is. And that means that it actually descends to a function on C. There are a number of issues about uh, what restrictions on A uh, finite Poisson action imposes, since we have it in variance under gauge transformations. Uh, this equation means that uh, there's something missing about the choice of the size of A in vertical directions, because you can change um, A in a vertical direction uh, without changing the Poisson action. And that's why I have put in an attempt to be honest, to be uh, sort of. Well, you, I don't have to show you that. You remember that I said sort of. Uh, an example, an, an instanton in R4 restricts to a solution uh, on the half space with finite Poisson action. So we, we have lots of solutions to the Yang-Mills Poisson equation. As to whether or not we have a solution for any initial condition, In, in H1 half? Uh, the answer is, I think so. The status of the theorem that it has a unique solution with finite action is uh, I, don't, I don't have a proof. So I, I'm not going to show you a proof because I don't have one. It would save us a lot of time. Uh, however, there's a lot of work that has been done on this kind of problem. The, uh, the Poisson equation, I, I've described it as uh, uh, an evolution equation. But actually, it's an elliptic equation on a half space. And the, uh, 
the way I've described it with the initial condition A, uh, it's really a Dirichlet problem for a nonlinear degenerate elliptic equation on half space. Uh, this has been studied uh, quite extensively by Antonella Marini and some of her co-authors. Uh, there's a lot of references here, which you can look up. And the, her work does not prove the, does not prove this theorem, but it comes very close. So I'm going to assume that that theorem is correct for the rest of this talk. Now you can maybe get an idea of why this paper is published in a physics journal. Why don't you call it a conjecture? Uh, yes, oh, good idea. We will assume that this conjecture is correct in the rest of this talk. Now, going back to the space of connections, remember we were really interested in the um, configuration space, but the, we, really, we really have to deal with the connections themselves, the connection forms themselves, and they lie upstairs in the big space A and uh, so I'm going to define uh, A plus to be the set of those uh, connection forms A, who, which it's a Poisson, Yang Mills Poisson extension is anti self dual and A minus self dual. And uh, both of these are gauge invariant sets. And therefore, they both project down meaningfully to configuration space, giving us two submanifolds of the configuration space C. Now, what would we like? Uh, you know that I am aiming for having this decomposition, C plus and minus, play the same role uh, in Yang-Mills theory as, the, as it did in in electromagnetic theory. And uh, in electromagnetic theory, uh, we had a decomposition of configuration space into the C plus and C minus defined by the spectral subspaces of curl, less or equal to zero, greater or equal to zero. And, and there is a projection that projects, projects A an element A of configuration space into C plus and another one into C minus. Uh, this line is intended to be the straight line joining A to its projection. And this is a straight line joining A to its projection. In the Yang-Mills case, the configuration space C is, uh, you're not supposed to see this. The configuration space C is curved. The uh, C plus and C minus are some manifolds. And what we can hope for is that uh, there is a flow from uh, an arbitrary point A in configuration space to the positive helicity subspace and another one to the negative helicity subspace. And if we are lucky, maybe these two flows will actually be orthogonal to each other. As far as the curl property goes, uh, curl, nor its covariant version, makes sense as operators uh, on potentials themselves. Um, because of, um, it, it, it makes no gauge, it makes no gauge invariant sense for them. But uh, the covariant curl does act on tangent vectors to configuration space. And if uh, U is, let's say, a uh, tangent vector to the positive helicity subspace, the best one can hope for, by analogy with what happens in the electromagnetic theory, 
is that uh, the curl is positive on such a tangent vector. And of course, tangent vector to C minus curl should be negative. So theorem, yes, this picture does hold. So in particular, that mapping from A to A plus and A minus uh, gives a natural decomposition of C uh, as a Cartesian product, and the curl has the right sign on tension vectors to C plus or minus. So th this is the, the main theorem. And of course, it depends on the validity of the conjecture. So I, I want to try to give you an outline of the proof. Uh, the proof uh, it, it will look a little unmotivated if I gave it to you directly. So uh, I'm, I'm going to start with what happens in the abelian case. In the, in the electromagnetic case, uh, the subspaces C plus and minus are, are the null space, null spaces of the operator curl uh, minus or plus absolute value of curl. Let's focus on C plus. This is the null space of C minus absolute value of C. Uh, so this is zero on the subspace that we're after, uh, but it, it's uh, terribly big and, and negative on, on C minus. On C minus, this is a negative operator, and this is a negative operator. Both of these are unbounded there. So the difference is terribly big and negative. And so if you take the limit of the semigroup, this semigroup, it will knock off the negative frequency components and leave you, leave the positive frequency components alone and give you an element of C plus. And that's one way to think of getting a plus the projection from A. That's the projection into C plus. This is a functional analytic method, and we are dealing with nonlinear manifolds, so this is no good. So I'm going to re I'm going to describe this procedure a little bit differently. So the exponential is really the solution of the differential equation. Da dt equals here's the C. C A of T minus the absolute value of C A of T with initial condition A. Now let's take this point of view. Uh, this could always be done in any linear space. Uh, the linear operator A defines a, a vector field on configuration space. And what, we, what I want to do is to find an analog of that for our curved manifold. So does it have an analog in the non-abelian case? Sure, I wouldn't be asking. Now, the curl of A is the magnetic field B. So what could be more natural than to re replace B by the curvature of A in the non-abelian case? Now, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, now, I have switched gears. We are now using forms. DA is now a two-form. And the B the, that are previously was a vector field or a one form, an R3, we have to put the hard star in front of this when the time comes. Now, what, what about the other portion of this vector field? Uh, absolute value of C. In our nonlinear Uh, circumstance, uh, we don't have an, uh, an operator to take an absolute value of. But the, the Maxwell Poisson equation in the abelian case is given by uh, this formula. And so uh, the space and the time derivative, a prime of zero, is in fact minus CA. So here we have the vector field we're looking for. And we have an expression for it, which has an immediate extension to Yang-Mills Poisson equation. So starting with the Yang-Mills Poisson equation, and we, we have a candidate for the vector field, but which is nonlinear. This is quadratic, and this is uh, who knows how nonlinear this is. 
Anyway, H of A is now a, a k-valued one form for each A. Uh, one forms are tangent vectors, can be interpreted as tangent vectors to the manifold of all connections. And so this is actually a tangent vector to A. And moreover, it's a gauge covariant vector field. And so it descends to a vector field on configuration space. So what we're going to do is replace the um, linear vector field curl A minus absolute value of curl A that we were using in the electromagnetic case by this nonlinear vector field. So theorem. The limit of, now this is intended to represent the, the diffeomorphism flow of this vector field. It's the solution to the differential equation that we're studying. That limit exists and lies in C plus. And so we have a, we have a, a way to project in this nonlinear theory onto C plus and, and C minus. The, the proof of this makes rather specific use of many properties of the Poisson action that, that I'm using. Uh, the proof of this is no fun. Let me just say that uh, we, we use P of A itself as a, the Arpanov function. I already mentioned the trouble about uh, existence uniqueness, uh, uniqueness of solutions to the uh, YMP equation. And the, the truth is that the Poisson action may not be the, the only action that could be used here. The, uh, the fact that instantons relate so well to the yang mills Poisson equation is nice, uh, but it could be an indication that what I'm dealing with is just the semi-classical limit of the actual Euclidean quantum field theory. So the Euclidean quantum field theory probably gives other actions of which the Poisson action is a, um, a zeroth order approximation. There is a proposal by Moncrief and, and uh, his co-authors to regard something like the Poisson action that I just described, something like that Poisson, Poisson action, e to the minus p, uh, as a, a, an approximation to the ground state for the uh, Yang-Mills theory. That's a very promising proposal. And, and uh, uh, th that would affect the, our considerations about what should con constitute uh, helicity for Yang Mills theories. What I showed you was the two curves are, are part of what would be a foliation if one were to develop this theory uh, further. And although I didn't say anything about uh, quantum field theory uh, in this talk, uh, once you put the measure onto configuration space that one hopes exists for Yang Mills theory, the helicity manifolds stand a reasonable chance of being stochastically independent. That would be nice. This is true in the case of uh, electromagnetic theory. So with that, uh, I will quit. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for a really nice talk, Lenny. And now the floor is open to questions. And uh, can you tell us uh, how this sort of helicity business is, is helpful in quantum field theory like uh, how, how you how might one use this sort of thing you mentioned that in that last point four about the stochastic independence but 
uh, how would that help you if it were true? <laughs> Brian, why don't you identify yourself? Yes, uh, Brian Hall speaking from Notre Dame. Uh, <clears throat> and just asking about, yeah, how this might be used in uh, quantum field theory applications. Uh, the, the structure of the quantum field theory space, any element of structure that you can get from it, uh, uh, is good. Now, the, uh, the, the reason that, the, that this issue uh, came up uh, for me is that uh, uh, in the, uh, let's say, the electromagnetic case, if you look at the uh, expectation of the field A of xt, the quantized field in A of xt. In, in a state psi, which is, you know, a function on configuration space informally. And if, if that function depends only on C plus, say, psi depends only on C plus, then the expectation A of xt psi inner product with psi, that's the expectation of the field A uh, in the quantum state of psi. Uh, that happens to be a solution to classical Maxwell's equations um, with uh, only positive helicity plane waves in its plane wave expansion. And that means we are, we are back to the old plane wave expansion description of helicity. Uh, and uh, the, the, it, it sort of closes the circle, the decomposition of configuration space into two parts leads in the quantized version to uh, solutions to classical Maxwell's equations, uh, which have only plane wave, positive helicity plane wave waves in their, in their expansion. Now, if you try to do anything similar with the Yang-Mills theory, you are led to trying to show a stochastic independence of the two helicity manifolds. Uh, I tried to do that. I couldn't show stochastic independence, and I kind of doubt that it will apply for the Poisson action, but there is a hope that it might apply to the correct action, which itself might depend completely on getting Euclidean quantum field theory straight for Yang-Mills theory. Okay, good, thank you. There's an extensive study of, this is Arthur, there's an extensive study of lattice gauge theories. Is there an analog of these questions in that case? Uh, I think that there is a notion of um, uh, self-dual and anti-self-dual for lattice gauge theories. Um, yes, actually there is. I, I tried to make use of that uh, about a year ago. And uh, how, how that would be interpreted in terms of helicity, uh, that, that would be an interesting question. On the Euclidean side, uh, there is certainly a theory, but what that means in terms of uh, um, a, a lattice theory over uh, R3, which you then extend into in, in a hyperbolic way to um, functions on Z3 cross real line. Uh, I, I've never given that any thought. That sounds like it might be an interesting thing to look at though. Chris, have you ever thought about that? Pardon? I was wondering if Chris King had ever thought about it. He was here. Hi, Arthur. Um, I know is the short answer. So, <laughs> yeah. 
nothing to add, I'm afraid. Thank you, Len. That was that was a really enjoyable talk, by the way. My pleasure. I find that I'm looking at you rather than at you. So are, are there other questions? Any more questions? Well, if there are no more questions, I really would like to ask everybody to unmute themselves and to give Lenny a round of thanks. And we'll have another seminar in a week, and that will be by Tom Spencer. Great, thank you. It's a pleasure to uh, be able to join virtually. So <laughs> great to have you, Brian. This is Ambar. Thank you. Oh, bye bye. Bye.